Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. President Biden is back in the Oval Office after quarantining for nearly a week. Now on the top of his agenda, a conversation with Chinese leader Xi. The Senate passes a $52 billion bill to boost U.S. tech over China. But Senator Rubio slams the bill, saying it fails to protect U.S. tech. What comes next? Hosts of The View criticized a leading conservative youth organization, claiming that they're associated with neo-Nazis. Now the show apologizes. An atypical child custody case. Could someone lose their daughter for insisting that she's a girl? A Chicago mother's story. The FDA adds a warning to puberty blocker labels. It now warns of a certain symptom that may cause some to reconsider its use. If you're tired of the debate over the 2020 election fraud, a Wisconsin attorney says he's got evidence that could end the debate once and for all. Detained WNBA star Brittany Griner could be headed home soon. That's if Moscow accepts U.S. proposed deal. President Biden has recovered from COVID-19. He met reporters at, and White House staffers in the Rose Garden and gave an update on his health. Here's NTD's Melina Weiskup with more. President Biden this afternoon welcomed by an enthusiastic crowd of White House staffers and journalists as he announced he's tested negative this morning for COVID-19. The president quarantined for five days with mild-like symptoms. He used his first in-person appearance today to tout his administration's efforts for staving off the virus. My administration has made billions of dollars in funding available to improve ventilation in our schools and our public buildings. We've made tests widely available so you can take one before attending a large indoor gatherings or visiting with high risk individuals. We've made high quality masks available for free. So you should consider wearing a mask. The president contracted the virus despite being fully vaccinated. And while some Americans and doctors are skeptical of the vaccine's effectiveness and its side effects, President Biden defended the White House's aggressive push for people to get the shot. But the reality is that BA5 means many of us are still going to get COVID even if we take the precautions. That doesn't mean we are we're doing anything wrong. The president is now back in the Oval Office. On the top of his agenda is a highly anticipated call with Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping this Thursday. The president wants to make sure that the lines of communication with President Xi remain open because they need to. Um, that there's issues where we can cooperate with China on and then there's issues where obviously there's friction and tension. The two leaders last spoke in March. The White House has been mulling whether to waive tariffs on the country. These tariffs were imposed under the Trump administration to hold China accountable for stealing U.S. intellectual property and other unfair trade practices. But now the Biden administration is considering lifting these tariffs as a way to deal with inflation. White House officials are reluctant to say whether tariff talks will come up in this week's conversation between Xi and Biden. Well, I'm not going to speak to what the president's going to cover during the call, but what I will say this is that the president is focused on trying to address inflation. And officials have avoided answering questions over the past few days about what kind of impact waiving China tariffs would have on lowering costs here at home. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Passing sweeping legislation today, a group of bipartisan senators vows to boost U.S. chip production to outcompete China. But some lawmakers say there are critical errors in the bill that could subject the U.S. to CCP espionage. NTD's Iris Tao has more. The yeas are 64, the nays are 33, and the motion to concur with an amendment is agreed to. With broad bipartisan support, the Senate on Wednesday finally greenlighting a long-awaited semiconductor bill. But this is one of the most significant long-term thinking bills we've passed in a very long time. Now known as the Chips and Science Act, the $52 billion bill aims to address a chip shortage in the U.S. and reduce reliance on China. This is a bad day for President Xi and the Chinese Communist Party. And a group of bipartisan senators calling today's move a big step toward recognizing CCP threats. The slumbering giant that is America has finally awakened 
to the challenge that we face from the People's Republic of China, their aggressive posture in the region, and the potential they would have of cutting off our access to advanced semiconductors. But others say the bill is still too weak on China. In a Wednesday statement, Republican Senator Marco Rubio calls out Senate Democrats for blocking his amendment seeking to counter Beijing's espionage and intellectual theft. He writes, quote, no one should be surprised when we hear stories of Beijing stealing U.S. technology funded by this bill or companies producing more chips in China even as they receive money from the taxpayers. And Senator Maria Kentwell responds by telling NTD that this bill focuses on innovation while other actions are still being discussed. So we're very confident in this, very, in this first step. Uh, the conference could include other language. And after passing in the Senate, the legislation is now moving to the House, where Speaker Nancy Pelosi has said it does have the support for passing. And other key lawmakers have also said they could send the bill to Biden's desk by the end of this week. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Iris Tao, NTD News. Daytime talk show The View issued an on-air apology today to leading conservative youth organization Turning Point USA, or TPUSA. That's after the group threatened to sue over the host's comments on neo-Nazi protesters. On Monday, The View discussed a TPUSA event that took place over the weekend in Tampa, Florida. Co-host Joy Behar criticized the event because a group of neo-Nazi protesters showed up outside the venue. Fellow co-host Whoopi Goldberg also said the event let the protesters in. Later, The View read an on-air legal disclaimer saying TPUSA condemned the neo-Nazi protesters, who they said had nothing to do with the organization. In response, a lawyer for TPUSA wrote a cease and desist letter to ABC News on Tuesday. It called on the Disney-owned company to retract the defamatory statements. The letter obtained by Fox News says The View hosts intentionally and falsely associated TPUSA with neo-Nazi protesters outside the event, placing TPUSA and in a denigrating and false light and negatively impacting its public perception. Such action will not be tolerated. The letter added that TPUSA, quote, completely condemns the ideologies of neo-Nazism. The show issued the on-air apology and clarification this afternoon. And on to transgenderism. A Chicago mother hasn't seen her daughter for the past three years. She says she lost custody of her child for insisting that her daughter is a girl. Here's that story. The Independent Women's Forum, or IWF, reports that Jeanette Cooper from Chicago had custody of her daughter Sophia since Jeanette's divorce in 2015. She could have Sophia for seven nights and six days a week. One day of the week, Sophia was with her father. But that situation turned around abruptly. Now Jeanette is not allowed to talk to Sophia, see her, or visit her. She can only send her letters through the mail. The IWF interviewed Jeanette and made a short documentary. People who are imprisoned have more communication with their child than I do. Jeanette's ordeal started in 2019 with one of Sophia's usual custodial visits at her dad's place. Jeanette says her daughter never came back from that visit. I later found out that she had told her stepmom and her dad that she was trans and she didn't want to live with me anymore. She felt unsafe. After that, Child Protective Services started a seven-month investigation. Jeanette was assessed, and so was her ex-husband. After that report came out, I thought, surely this is going to resolve itself. Clearly, there is no finding of abuse or neglect. They didn't find anything about me that is unsafe. But, but Jeanette says that because she says that her child is a girl, she lost custody. She doesn't have her daughter's phone number. She isn't allowed to see her at school or at home. I'm not going to believe in a lie, and I'm not going to convince my daughter that somehow she is so weak that she cannot hear her birth name. According to the IWF, Sophia now, three years later, still presents herself as a girl, but goes by the name Ash. Her pronouns are Z, Zier, Ziers. Her father said in court documents that due to burgeoning adolescence and awakening awareness of self, Sophia was no longer mentally or emotionally safe with her real mother. According to Jeanette, the state should never take away someone's child without evidence of abuse or neglect. Reporting by Arian Pazdar, NTD News. 
And the FDA has added a new warning to the labeling of puberty blockers. It now says the drugs can cause symptoms such as headaches, nausea and vision loss. And one researcher explains there may be more than side effects to consider. NTD's Jason Perry has this story. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration recently added a warning to the label of puberty blockers, also known as gonadotropin-releasing hormone agonists, or GNRH agonists. In early July, the FDA said puberty blockers may cause a series of symptoms in children, including headaches, pressure buildup around the brain, and vision loss. The drug is FDA approved for the treatment of central precocious puberty, a condition where children experience puberty at younger than normal ages. It's also being used off-label by some medical practitioners who prescribe the drug to children who experience gender dysphoria with the consent of a parent or guardian. Dr. Jay Green, a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, a conservative think tank, says parents have good reason to be skeptical and resistant to their children using these drugs. These drugs have never been subject to a randomized experiment, like the kind that's normally required for initial approval of all drugs by the FDA. He explained that children experiencing gender dysphoria may have underlying conditions such as depression or anxiety. If we misdiagnose them as having, a, having gender dysphoria uh, and treat that as opposed to the underlying mental health issues, we're going to cause an increase in suicides. He says that according to his team's research, suicide rates among ages 12 to 23 increased by 14 percent in states where cross-sex medications and procedures became available without parental consent. I, I think the good news here is that parents are beginning to realize that this is something that they need to be in charge of, that they need to control the, the health and the education of their own children, uh, and need to make sure that they're not prescribing drugs or, or agreeing to surgeries that are going to permanently damage their girls um, and not address their real problems. We reached out to the FDA for comment, but we didn't hear back before airtime. Jason Perry, NTD News. A Wisconsin group concerned about election integrity uncovered evidence of what they say could lead to proof of systemic voter fraud in the 2020 election. NTD's Arlene Richards speaks to the group's attorney about Wisconsin's no-vote guardianship order. Under Wisconsin law, state courts must provide election officials with a list of people declared incompetent to vote by what's called a no-vote guardianship order. Then, under the law, election officials must check off the word incompetent in the data field of their WisVote database. This prevents identified people from being registered as active voters. But the Wisconsin Voter Alliance, a group concerned about election integrity, interviewed nursing home residents deemed incompetent and found out two of them voted in the 2020 election. The group's attorney, Eric Cardell, says one thing led to another. That the Wisconsin Elections Commission was not maintaining in the WISVOTE database an accurate identification of those people who are wards under no vote guardianship orders. And then that led to administrative complaints against the Wisconsin Election Commission. Cardall said once a voter's name is listed in the statewide voter database, it's never removed. And so what was horrifying for us was in the snapshot of the database taken November 10th, 2020, one week after the election, there are only about 800 people that were identified as incompetent and only one in the whole city of Milwaukee. The question, he said, is why? He reached out to all 72 counties in the state asking for court registers of no-vote guardianship orders. Only 13 counties cooperated. The number of no-vote guardianships registered in 13 counties were 20 times higher than those identified in the WISVOTE database. Cardall explained how nursing home residents under no-vote guardianship could still be voting. The director of activities receiving the absentee ballots and basically making sure they're all filled out. Because when the nursing home activities director is going to vote all the ballots, you know, it's an extra step to go check to see in the business office who's under guardianship or not. But Wisconsin Election Commission is in the position to stop it. Cardell said he believes his investigation will reveal systemic statewide voter fraud. We reached out to the commission, but we didn't hear back from them before broadcast time. 
Arlene Richards, NTD News, New York. And in Florida, Governor Ron DeSantis is following the money. He's now targeting large corporations that he says are imposing their policies through economic power rather than at the ballot box. NTD's Jason Perry with that story. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says he's protecting Floridians from woke capital. You know, who governs society? You know, do we govern ourselves through our constitution and through our elections? Or do we have these masters of the universe occupying these commanding heights of society? Are they DeSantis says some large corporations are discriminating against customers for their religious, political or social beliefs, while at the same time trying to shape society. Many of these banks have said we are not doing any financing or providing any services for contractors for immigration enforcement. So they're basically using their economic power to try to have open border policies. He also accused some banks of colluding against the firearms industry to not allow them to get financing and mentioned that GoFundMe froze donations to the Freedom Convoy. You also have things like PayPal, and you're going to hear from Tina about PayPal, how they will cut off people that they basically disagree with. Tina Deskovich is the co-founder of Moms for Liberty, an organization that defends parental rights. She says the last time PayPal interfered with her donor accounts was when DeSantis spoke at a Moms for Liberty event. I started receiving emails that our donors were being kicked off of PayPal and none of their monthly donations would be able to be processed again. All funding abruptly stopped. While not nearly as devastating the second time, our organization was left to contact each of these remaining monthly contributors individually, asking them to reestablish their giving through other means. DeSantis is now proposing legislation that will prohibit banks, credit card companies, and money transmitters from discriminating against customers for their religious, political, or social beliefs. Jason Perry, NTD News. And here's an update on the 16-year-old boy who was caught on video assaulting police officers in a New York City subway station Saturday. That's after they stopped him for allegedly jumping a turnstile. Fox News reports that he's been released without bail despite throwing more than 20 punches at one officer and allegedly having multiple offenses behind him. Here to speak with us is Jason Johnson, the president of the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. I spoke with him earlier today. Jason Johnson, welcome to our show. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you. Now, the teen who was seen punching a police officer in a New York City subway station brawl has been released. What's your take on what's happened? Well, listen, it, it just continues to amaze, I think, most reasonable people, the level of um, the lack of accountability, really, for, for uh, folks in cities that uh, they could be arrested for a violent offense, be back on the street, and and not have learned any sort of a lesson, and resist police officers in a, in, a, in a violent way, in a way that seemed to be calculated to injure police officers. And the fact that this person is a young person doesn't speak well of of the state of our our society. Do you think incidents like this one, directly or indirectly, encourage a culture of disrespect for law enforcement? Yeah, I don't think there's any question that we're living through a, a period uh, in which disrespect toward law enforcement is not only being tolerated, but in some circles is being uh, promoted. Um, you know, the beginning really in 2020, there's just been an, a real, really strong backlash against law enforcement. And, and in many cases, uh, using false narratives uh, to stoke emotions, to, to make people feel like police officers are the enemies, uh, and to and, and really to promote violence against police officers. And I think that's this this uh, particular incident is just one episode in, in, a, in a sad chapter, um, uh, you know, of police community relations. The New York Post says that this teenage boy had just been released from a violent robbery case uh, without bail. Do you think this is just bad judgment on the part of the district attorney's office or is there something else more nuanced going on here? Well, it's just a continuation of the philosophy uh, in in Manhattan and in, in New York generally and in other cities and other counties even, now major counties, uh, prosecutors are being elected who make no secret of the fact that they do not support 
uh, traditional bail systems. They do not support detaining even violent offenders uh, pending trial. They don't support seeking incarceration of violent offenders. They don't s support prosecuting certain nonviolent offenses, which include trespassing, theft, prostitution, drug possession, and possession many times uh, includes possession with intent to distribute. Uh, and and uh, on, on balance, these policies promote uh, lawlessness, disorder, and uh, really promote the, the kind of conduct that you see in that disgusting video. Police are saying they're feeling abandoned by a justice system that they say really doesn't uh, protect them or back them up in any way anymore. Do you think that this growing practice of avoiding pretrial detention is contributing to this declining morale among police? It does. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is but one element, but it is an element. So imagine you're a law enforcement officer who uh, takes seriously their role to go out and find people committing crime, uh, including violent crime, to detain them, to go through the process of, of charging them, presenting them to the justice system so that justice can be done. And then you find out the very next day, some of these violent offenders who've been taken off the street are right back out on the street. And it hasn't even, they haven't even adjusted their conduct to refrain from assaulting law enforcement officers. What that tells our officers is the work that you do isn't important, uh, it's not valued. And in fact, uh, some of these prosecutors spend more time critiquing and seeking charges against police officers than they do uh, actually trying to hold violent offenders accountable. On, on net, uh, this tells our officers that they aren't important, their work isn't important, and in fact that they're, they're the enemy of, of the system. And this is this is really driving, uh, uh, as I said, uh, you know, dark chapter in, in the history of law enforcement. Mayor Eric Adams has said that this boy is a poster child for everything that's wrong with the justice system in New York. What do you think he can or should do to change the situation? Well, you know, I think the mayor, uh, you know, he, he ran on a, on a uh, sort of a law and order platform that using his his uh, personal history as a, as a law enforcement officer and approaching this as a, in, in a more traditional way, that's sort of how he ran. I think he needs to be more vocal and point out the failures of the system to use, use his position as mayor uh, as a bully pulpit to get, uh, you know, uh, the district attorney to, to take a harder stance on violent criminals, to seek uh, the, their detention pending trial, even young violent offenders, and to generally tr just make more of an effort to create, uh, to, to, to sort of roll back the clock to the, what we know is the good old days, weren't that long ago, where the streets of New York were safe, where people felt very comfortable coming into the city and didn't feel like they were gonna be a victim of a robbery. You didn't see viral videos of police officers being assaulted in the subway or anywhere else. And uh, I think that's his role as mayor. I think that's why he was elected. And I think most people would just like to see and take more of an active role in that. Jason Johnson from the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be with you. And now to the economy. In an effort to tame inflation, the Federal Reserve today hiked interest rates by three quarters of a percentage point. And Fed Chair Jerome Powell says this may not be the last large increase. While another unusually large increase could be appropriate at our next meeting, that is a decision that will depend on the data we get between now and then. As the stance of monetary policy tightens further, it likely will become appropriate to slow the pace of increases while we assess how our cumulative policy adjustments are affecting the economy and inflation. Typically, the Fed increases the rate by a quarter of a percentage point at a time, but the last two increases have both been by three quarters. That marks the first time since 1994 interest rates have increased at that rate. This comes as consumers face the highest price increases since the 1980s. And here to talk to NTD's Don Ma is Nathan Lewis. He co-wrote a book with Steve Forbes titled Inflation, What It Is, Why It's Bad, and How to Fix It. He's also the principal at Kiku Capital Advisors. Nathan, thanks for coming on. So, you know, the Fed raised rates by 75 basis points today. You know, just give us your initial, initial thoughts on that. Is it too aggressive, not aggressive enough? What's going to happen next? Just tell us your thoughts. I think they took care to be as, as in line with expectations as, as the Fed could possibly be. It seems that everyone was not surprised. My, my personal view, my somewhat idiosyncratic view, 
is that uh, we have way too much focus on this whole interest rate thing. And we kind of embraced kind of by default this idea that we have inflation. Uh, but where did that come from? Well, it seems to have come from two things. It seemed to come from kind of a lot of excess money creation back in the COVID days, back in 2020, and also all these supply chain type things that, that we all know about. Well, the kind of the theory here is that, well, if we raise interest rates, then that'll make unemployment go up. And then if unemployment goes up, we, people won't have any money to buy stuff and, and that will make prices come down. Well, that's kind of the three wrongs make a right theory. It's not a very good system. And, and I think we're kind of going to get into trouble, uh, at least some trouble because of that. Yes, I think this rate hike is going to exacerbate the recessionary tendencies that are already uh, with us. I think other people are sort of kind of chewing over these same issues. I mean, do we really have to cause a recession on purpose to fix supply chain problem? Is that our solution? What do you think it is? Do you agree with, you know, Powell said today we might need to see some slowing in order for inflation to come down. So do you agree with that? Do you think we might actually have to go into recession to get, you know, inflation down to the Fed's 2% target? Um, well, I think that will tend to moderate demand and bring inflation down, just as many people expect. We are to a little, some de degree on, you know, untested ground here. We're playing with different kinds of interest rates than we did in the past. And we might find that it, it's kind of destructive. And we're kind of imposing on the market a higher interest rate than maybe it can bear comfortably. So you wrote the book, uh, you wrote a book on inflation, right? So I guess, well, just one last question. How do you fix, what, what's the solution to inflation? Uh, the solution to inflation today and in all centuries up to this time it is the same. Don't let your currency fall in value. And now we had a substantial decline in the current value of our currency and all around the world in response to COVID. They printed a ton of money. Uh, it had the same old consequences that it has often had in the past. Uh, but as long as you don't have any further declines in currency value, then you're not going to have any further inflation. You still have the consequences of that prior move. Uh, that's still filtering through. It's going to continue to filter through for a number of years. Um, but that's the basic solution. Uh, to take uh, extreme, this is very obvious an extreme example. For example, uh, Bulgaria in 1997 had terrible hyperinflation. They had, I don't know, like 160% per month or something like that. You know, not, not from a year earlier, from a month earlier. And then they fixed their collapsing currency to the euro, and the hyperinflation was over in a matter of you know a couple of days. There's a ton of discussion about inflation these days in every financial journal. When is the last time you heard someone say, it's because your currency declined in value, the solution is don't do that? We kind of know it's true. <laughs> and I don't have to explain very much, right? Macroeconomic concepts here. We know it's true, but you never hear that. So I hope, hopefully we'll get around to that, getting to that uh, discussion at some point. Yeah, well, we'll see. Well, anyways, Nathan Lewis, principal at Kiku Capital Advisors, thanks for coming on today. Thank you. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at eveningnews at ntd.com. And coming up, a California county is being sued for allegedly encouraging racial quotas in its contracts awards. The suit says such practices are a violation of the state and U.S. constitutions. And in basketball news, WNBA star Brittany Griner could be headed home soon. And today's Dave Martin has the details of the deal the U.S. proposed to Russia. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today.
Oh, hey, doesn't it feel like there's communists everywhere? In fact, the Chinese Communist Party has been subverting America from every angle. So whether it's compromising our politicians, controlling Hollywood, manipulating Wall Street, or infiltrating our schools, they have stopped at nothing to take down America. And I believe that in order for us to not become like China, we need citizens who know the truth. So go on over to getepic.com, stay informed with a subscription to the Epic Times, and you will get instant access to this infographic. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held from September 29th to October 2nd at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. Over to the West Coast. A county in California is being sued for programs that allegedly discriminate against qualified contractors based on their race. Prosecutors say that these programs are unconstitutional and against the law. NTD's Cynthia Kai has that story. The Californians for Equal Rights Foundation, along with two co-plaintiffs, filed a complaint in the Superior Court of California this week against Alameda County. They're alleging state programs encourage racial quotas. The argument of the lawsuit is that the Alameda County government is violating both the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and the California State Constitution, uh, the, the Equal Protection Clause in the State Constitution specifically, by two, implementing two public contracting programs that set aside 15 percent of uh, quotas or participation goals for minority-owned businesses. Wu and her foundation's co-plaintiffs are suing over the Alameda County Construction Compliance Program and Enhanced Construction Outreach Program. The Pacific Legal Foundation, who is representing the co-plaintiffs, have said that governments should not be denying small businesses a contract based solely on their race. The impact of having racial quotas under the ban of a participation goal for minority-owned businesses is discrimination. Looking at uh, preferential treatment translating into uh, inefficiency, translating into um, a process of awarding government contracts not on the basis of merit, but on the basis of race. Many construction company owners, including those who would benefit from the racial quotas, have commented that these programs have been more negative on the county and state. Andrew Salazar, a Los Angeles-based mixed-race construction company planner, told the California Globe that minority-owned company set-asides and quotas have proven to be more harmful than good. He also comments that the government is choosing companies based on their race instead of going with, quote, quality or the lowest bidder. According to the complaint, the law is taking advantage of taxpayers and denying equal opportunity for all contracting companies through, quote, government-sanctioned racial discrimination. A scheduled court date for the lawsuit is still pending. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. Staying in California, during the pandemic, the state's judicial courts and counties were faced with reducing COVID transmissions in in jails. Many did so by releasing inmates, which critics say came at the cost of public safety. One mayor in Silicon Valley is now speaking out against catching and releasing repeat criminals without bail. NTD's David Lamb reports. On Wednesday, San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo called on Santa Clara County officials to make changes to the county's catch and release justice system as part of COVID-19 related policies. Our goal is to halt the spinning turnstile at the jailhouse door. And the only way we can do that is by returning to what the California Constitution. During COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns, the county enacted an emergency zero bail practice which allowed suspects of crimes such as human trafficking, assault, and hostage-taking to be released. Licardo says judges have voted for this order to expire in July, 
but he's dissatisfied with the county's mandate of reducing the jail population. And what I'm urging is first that judges, not bureaucrats, make these decisions on releases. And secondly, that we restore the primacy of community safety in these decisions. Santa Clara County is a densely populated area in California's Silicon Valley, estimated to have a population of nearly 2 million people. In the last two years, Licardo said 43 individuals were arrested and brought to county jail 10 or more times. The San Jose Police Department cited or arrested nearly 900 individuals on five separate occasions. And they could be released anywhere from hours to minutes later. According to SJPD crime data, there have been over 1,800 more violent and property crimes in the first half of 2022 compared to the same time last year. Businesses were common victims of repeated crimes during lockdowns. At the coffee shop, uh, three incidents, um, they burned the, um, the window uh, planter box and then vandalized um, the flower pots. Um, we replace it, in one month they vandalize again. We need to make sure we make our guests to feel safe, our employees to feel safe, and we have the same repeat offenders. So now we're trying to figure out that we need to police our own businesses and we need to watch what's going on and take... The mayor says he's waiting for the county supervisors to take action. David Lamb, NTD News, California. And now over to sports news. Here's NTD's Dave Martin with today's top stories. WNBA star Brittany Griner was back in a Russian courtroom today. She testified that an interpreter translated only a fraction of what was said after officials found cannabis oil in her luggage back on February 17th. Griner also said her rights were never explained to her. She had no initial access to a lawyer and was told to sign documents without knowing what they implied. The six foot nine Olympian also said she used cannabis oil for medicinal purposes and said she didn't mean to bring it to Russia. She said she had a doctor's note to take it and that she suffers pain from injuries suffered during her basketball career. Griner's trial started back on July 1st, though she's already pled guilty to drug possession charges and faces up to 10 years in jail. Despite her guilty plea, there's no telling when her trial will end. The court has extended her detention until December 20th. In a stunning turn of events today, though, Secretary of State Antony Blinken has announced they've offered a deal to Russia to bring Griner and fellow detained American Paul Whelan home. Blinken did not offer details on the deal, though he said it happened weeks ago and that Washington would like a response from Moscow. In NFL news, Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones issued an apology Tuesday after using what the little people of America called an offensive word at the team's training camp. Jones was talking about Dallas's late scouting director Larry Lacewell when he said, quote, Lace held court out here. I'm going to get me somebody, a midget, to stand up there with me and dress him up like Lace and think Lace is still out here helping us. The Little People of America said in a statement to TMZ that that term has widely been known to be derogatory for years and should be common knowledge to someone in the public arena such as Jerry Jones. The 79-year-old Jones has owned the Cowboys since 1989. Today was the first day of Cowboys training camp. Elsewhere in the league, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have signed veteran wide receiver Julio Jones to a one-year deal. The two-time All-Pro has twice led the league in receiving yards and has been named to the Pro Bowl seven times in his illustrious career. Jones will pair with quarterback Tom Brady, who foiled Jones' only Super Bowl appearance by leading his Patriots back from a 25-point deficit to win in overtime versus Jones Falcons in Super Bowl 51. The 33-year-old leads the NFL in receiving yards since 2014 with over 10,000, while his new teammate Mike Evans has accumulated the most receiving touchdowns with 75. Jones spent the first 10 years of his career with Atlanta before signing with Tennessee last season. The NFL season starts on September 8th. And in golf, the Upstart Live Golf Series has announced their 2023 schedule, which will feature 14 events with a total purse 
of $405 million. The league has attracted former PGA stars such as Dustin Johnson, Phil Mickelson, Brooks Kepka, and Sergio Garcia. Liv has featured tournaments with record purses while playing 54 hole events with no weekend cuts. Liv Golf's third event will be played this weekend at Trump National Golf Club Bedminster in New Jersey. That's all for your sports news today. Back to you, Steph. Thanks, Dave. And still to come, the Chinese Communist Party is buying up farmland in North Dakota. And the land is near a military base. U.S. lawmakers are voicing concern. And China reportedly tried to recruit informants in the Federal Reserve. A congressional report says Beijing is trying to build a network of influence. Stay tuned for more when we come back. Navigating a world of economic madness, you need to have the right guide. What do today's decisions mean for your tomorrow? We ask why, what's the alternative? Uncover the deeper reasons and the hidden influences and highlight the real opportunities for profit. At Entity Business, we connect the dots for you. Good evening. The Chinese regime is buying up farmland in North Dakota. The problem is, the plots of land are close to a U.S. Air Force base. Now American officials are raising concern. Could the Chinese Communist Party use the land to spy on the U.S. military? The Grand Forks Air Force Base is home to some of the country's most sensitive military technology. That includes drone technology used for space and satellite operations. The base is also home to a networking center. A local senator says it handles the backbone of all U.S. military communications across the globe. The land purchase is a $2.6 billion deal by Chinese company Fufan Group. The city's mayor has pushed for the project, which he said is the largest single investment in the city's history. But some locals don't like the deal. One of the land sellers, Gary Bridgeford, told CNBC he had been called every name in the book by his neighbors for selling the property. Former telecom executive John Pelson told us it's not the amount of land China is buying that's the most concerning. It's where they are buying it. But if you're building $700 million worth of corn milling and processing, which is what the Chinese company supposedly wants to do, there's going to be every opportunity there to make this an eavesdropping site. And there was no credibility, in my opinion, to the story about why they had to pick that location, which they acknowledged isn't near their customers, is far north for where they would have otherwise put it, and is the only location they're going to have in the United States. They decided that North Dakota was a place to be. A representative for the Fufan Group's U.S. subsidiary denied the espionage accusations. China has a pattern of buying American land near sensitive military locations. In 2021, a former Chinese military official bought 130,000 acres of land close to Laughlin Air Base in Texas. The land bought by China surrounds that sensitive air base. Lawmakers and officials from both parties, including Elizabeth Warren and Mike Pence, have raised concerns about it. As part of the land purchases, China has been growing its presence in the American food system. In total, as of 2020, Chinese investors had bought almost 200,000 acres of farmland, worth a value of $1.9 billion. And the Chinese Communist Party has reportedly been recruiting informants inside the Federal Reserve. At one point, the regime even allegedly threatened to imprison a Fed economist during a trip to Shanghai. It was an attempt to force him to offer non-public American economic data. NTD's Fake Quarter has more. The details about the CCP targeting the Federal Reserve come from a recent Senate report and represent the latest Beijing effort to gather sensitive American data. Its goal? To build a network of influence inside U.S. institutions and government agencies. 
The report also reveals that in 2015, the Federal Reserve identified 13 of its staff as persons of interest who had troubling ties to the Chinese regime. Now, the Republican-led Senate committee is scolding the Fed for failing to combat Chinese espionage attempts, while Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is strongly pushing back on the report. On Monday, Powell wrote in a letter calling the findings unfair, unsubstantiated, and unverified insinuations. The Chinese regime denies the espionage accusations. The Senate report reveals that in one case, a Fed worker was allegedly detained on four separate occasions during a 2019 trip to Shanghai. Chinese officials were said to have threatened to harm his family unless he offered up sensitive American economic data. Chinese officials also reportedly tapped his computers and phones and copied the contact info of other Fed officials from his WeChat account. The Chinese official then allegedly asked him to sign a letter promising not to discuss the incident with anyone. In 2019, the Fed ultimately issued a general warning to all economists preparing to travel to China, according to the report. Faye Quarter, NTD News. Over to Europe. The French government had hoped to extend its emergency COVID powers. They include measures such as lockdowns, curfews, and a mandatory health pass for French citizens in the case of a new COVID wave. But opposition lawmakers in Parliament rejected the government's bill, which makes it almost impossible for these restrictive measures to be applied again. Here's more from NTD's David Vivas. It's the latest defeat for French President Emmanuel Macron. His parliamentary group wanted to pass a new COVID health bill. The law would have extended the government's power to bring back lockdowns, curfews and the so-called health pass, which limits access to cafes, restaurants and other public venues to the vaccinated. The government's version of the bill was rejected for the first in mid-July, then went through a back and forth between the upper and lower houses of parliament, and finally failed yesterday. In other words, it's the likely end of the COVID emergency measures in France. Mathematician Vincent Pavon has conducted studies to monitor the efficacy of the health pass. He says the measure isn't based in science. At the end of last year, I looked at different models on the health pass. It was claimed the pass is able to stop the spread of the epidemic by asking the non-vaccinated not to enter certain places or to stay at home. This is nonsense. There is nothing scientific about it. It has absolutely no basis. All this is really a kind of occult belief. It's not scientific. It's scandalous to be there today with all the methods of observation and analysis. The statistics exist, and there's nothing to draw from them. It is very mysterious for me. I do not understand. Parliament also rejected a COVID health pass requirement to travelers to enter France. But in the event of a dangerous new COVID variant, border agents can ask for a negative test. Since its first introduction in 2021, the health pass has been criticized for restraining freedom of movement, which is a constitutional right. Pavon says the government has been using contradictory language to force restrictive measures such as lockdowns on people. Macron's way to communicate is to say two contradictory things. Contradiction is a way to drive people crazy, as they cannot be rational anymore. The government said, when care for each other, we keep a distance. It is a cognitive bias that allows to manipulate and make people unable to have a critical mind, since criticism is based on logic. Official figures indicate the end of France's seventh COVID wave as numbers for hospital admissions are falling. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Coming up, if you're thinking of adopting a pet, there may be some places that are better than others to go find the animal you're looking for. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got MyPillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well-rested in the morning. That's why I invented MyPillow. 
My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you get one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and you get a second set absolutely free. Or my six piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or get my classic premium My Pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com and use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all my pillow products. Well, almost everything can be purchased conveniently online, including even pets, some things are better done the old-fashioned way. NTD's Jackie Rios went out to hear why, if you're looking for a pet, animal shelters may be the better way to go. Many people want to own a pet, a cat or a dog, but what's the best and safest way for you to become a pet owner? We visited a Los Angeles County animal shelter to find out how you can become a proud parent of a four-legged creature. Last week, the manager of the Baldwin Park Animal Care Center talked about all the advantages of adopting a pet from a care shelter. Maria Rosales introduced a wide range of pets available for adoption. We do have dogs, we have cats, uh, we have rabbits, guinea pigs, um, hamsters, uh, snakes, uh, turtles. Uh, we also have farm animals, we have pigs, um, we have um, birds, uh, we have roosters, chickens, uh, a variety of animals. Rosales mentioned the reasons why buying from a shelter may be a better option. But keeping in mind, you know, that when they're um, getting that pet from uh, somewhere else versus coming here, um, you know, the animal may not be vaccinated, they may not be microchipped, they may not be spayed or neutered. Uh, therefore, you know, we encourage, you know, public or families, you know, wanting to adopt to come directly to us and save an animal here. She explained the benefits of the shelter microchipping an animal. For those animal lovers who have lost a pet in the past, this might be a great incentive to come to a shelter. One of the biggest uh, benefits of microchipping an animal is um, if that animal, you know, um, goes out of your um, or leaves your house, is roaming on the street, somebody brings it in, um, those animals, you know, we're able to scan them and alert the uh, the pet owner that their animal is here and the fastest way that you know that we can get get the pet owner to come and retrieve the animal is by scanning that microchip. Rosales said the shelter's website works real time and the shelter offers specials regularly. Of course families can come in person as well. They can either come here in person or they can also go on our website. Um, the description of the animal, uh, a variety of breeds um, are listed. And as they're incoming here into our care center, they go live on our website. So anything that they see on the website is, is also here in our care center. All seven of the Alley County Animal Shelters are over capacity. Rosales reminded potential pet owners their goal in adopting out animals. To save a life, needless to say, is the best and most rewarding, you know, feeling that a person can have. You know, we have so many well-deserved animals, deserving animals here at our care centers that are just waiting for that person to come in, open up their heart and their home and adopt. You know, our focus is to have live and positive outcomes for any animal that comes into our care center. From pit bulls to poodles to cats and rabbits, if you want to add a pet to your family, County-run animal shelters are a great place to start. Jack Urios, NTD News, Los Angeles. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.